When SpaceX CEO Elon Musk and President Trump took to social media to talk about quickly bringing back two NASA Starliner astronauts who have been on the space station since their spacecraft malfunctioned in June, it's easy to imagine a rush rocket launch to retrieve them, just like in a movie. This would mark a dramatic shift in spaceflight plans, leaving many world powers stunned. But can the schedule for such a mission truly change, as Trump and Elon have said? Let's find out on today's episode of Alpha Tech. Recently, Elon posted on X that the president had asked SpaceX to bring the two stranded astronauts back to Earth. Elon added that SpaceX would do so, and it was terrible that the Biden administration left them up there for so long. A few hours later, President Trump himself weighed in, saying, I've just asked Elon and SpaceX to go get the two brave astronauts who have been virtually abandoned in space by the Biden administration. They've been waiting for many months on space station. Elon will soon be on his way. Hopefully, all will be safe. Good luck. This has sparked considerable debate in the space community, as NASA had already planned a return schedule for the two astronauts. NASA does not have its own spacecraft to send astronauts to the space station. Currently, SpaceX is the only U.S. private company under contract with NASA capable of doing so. The second company with a NASA contract is Boeing, which built the spacecraft that transported Wilmore and Williams to the station in June. However, technical issues with Starliner raised concerns about the potential risks during undocking and reentry. After extensive discussions between Boeing and NASA teams, the decision was made to return Starliner to Earth without the two astronauts. The spacecraft landed intact in early September, and instead, Wilmore and Williams were reassigned to NASA's Crew-9 mission. By integrating them into Crew-9, their stay on the station was extended far beyond the original plan. Initially, their mission was meant to last just 10 days. However, as part of Crew-9, they would now live and work on the station for several months, with their return originally scheduled for February after their replacements, Crew-10, had launched. When Will Moore and Williams finally return, they will board the SpaceX Crew-9 Dragon, the same spacecraft that brought the other two Crew-9 members, NASA astronaut Nick Haig and Russian cosmonaut Alexander Gorbanov, to the station in September. However, their return schedule has faced complications. SpaceX encountered delays in upgrading the Crew-10 Dragon, pushing back its launch. This, in turn, delayed the return of Will Moore, Williams, and the other two Crew-9 members until at least late March. Perhaps due to these delays, both Elon and Trump criticized the administration responsible at the time, the Biden administration. Musk's promise to carry out the return mission quickly, even ahead of schedule, has been framed as the only viable solution to this issue. Soon after, NASA issued the following statement on Wednesday. NASA and SpaceX are expeditiously working to safely return the agency's SpaceX Crew-9 astronauts Suni Williams and Butch Wilmore as soon as practical while also preparing for the launch of Crew-10 to complete a handover between expeditions. That might suggest that SpaceX is moving faster than anticipated in getting the Crew-10 Dragon ready to go. However, if President Trump were to demand that NASA bring the astronauts back to Earth immediately, the Crew-9 mission would get cut short. As of now, Crew-9 is scheduled to land in the Pacific in early April. According to NASA and the astronauts themselves, Will Moore and Williams, they're in stable condition in space. However, no one can truly predict how prolonged isolation in such a confined environment might affect their mental state. The emotional toll of missing their families, especially when they originally expected to return sooner, is another factor to consider. Wilmore and Williams had not planned to stay in space for 10 months. The extension of their mission disrupted the original schedule, and while handling unexpected changes as part of the job, it's a challenge that they have to face. To meet President Trump's demand for an immediate return, SpaceX might have to repurpose a previously flown Dragon spacecraft, possibly the one planned for Axiom 4 to carry out Crew-10's mission. NASA is eager for the Crew-10 astronauts to arrive at the ISS before Crew-9 departs. The reason? If Crew-9 returns early, only one NASA astronaut, Don Pettit, would be left on board. Although Pettit is highly experienced, operating the U.S. segment of the station alone is far from ideal. It would place pressure on him, forcing NASA to cancel a planned spacewalk and leave just one person to prepare the Northrop Grumman cargo spacecraft for departure. Major operational setbacks. Another critical concern is space waste management. A NASA source explained that batteries must be stored in fireproof containers and trash bags need to be carefully arranged to maintain the spacecraft's balance.
With seven crew members on board, a substantial amount of waste has accumulated since that last disposal flight, making organization a time-consuming task. There's also the uncertainty of whether Crew 10's launch might be delayed beyond its current late March target. Pettit arrived at the station aboard a Russian Soyuz spacecraft, which is scheduled to return on April 20th. However, Soyuz vehicles are only certified to stay in orbit for 210 days, and by April 20th, it will have been 221 days since launch, pushing the mission dangerously close to the limit. Technically speaking, the so-called stranded astronauts could come back as early as next week, but doing so would create serious logistical headaches for NASA, its international partners, and even Elon's human spaceflight team at SpaceX. So, can the plan really change? We'll have to wait for further updates from NASA and SpaceX. While the issue continues to spark debate, NASA and Boeing have made some initial progress in investigating the Starliner's technical problems. Although this is a positive step, progress has been slow compared to the urgency surrounding Starliner's launch schedule. Plus, the spacecraft's main issue, problems with the thrusters, is still unresolved. Paul Hill, a member of the Earth's Space Advisory Panel, said at a January 30th public meeting that the committee was briefed on the status regarding Starliner's crew flight test mission recently. And that mission launched in June with NASA astronauts Wilmore and Williams on board, but the spacecraft came back to Earth three months later uncrewed because of agency concerns about the performance of the thrusters. NASA reported that significant progress is being made regarding Starliner CFT's post-flight activities, he said. Integrated NASA Boeing teams have begun closing out flight observations and in-flight anomalies. He didn't elaborate on the specific issues that the team had closed out, but stated that it did not include the thrusters, several of which shut down during the spacecraft's approach to the station. The propulsion system also suffered several helium leaks. The program anticipates the propulsive system anomalies will remain open, he said, pending ongoing test campaigns, adding that there are teams studying the root cause of the thruster problems, developing recommendations for changes to future missions, and accessing technical and organizational factors that may have played a role. Hill said ASAP was satisfied with the progress and course of action by Boeing and NASA. The details shared by NASA gave us confidence that they are focusing on the right core issues and the related path to safely flying Starliner. While the ASAP meeting did not give any technical details about the Starliner investigation, it was perhaps the most detailed public update into the investigation since Starliner's return nearly five months ago. NASA, Onor, Boeing have given much information about the investigation since the landing. The ASAP briefing did not discuss whether Starliner might fly again and whether it'd be another test flight with or without crew on board or as a long-duration crew rotation mission. The timing and configuration of Starliner's next flight will be determined once a better understanding of Boeing's path to the system certification is established, NASA stated in October. NASA is keeping options on the table for how best to achieve system certification, including windows of opportunity for a potential Starliner flight in 2025. The agency stated then, but has not offered an update since then on when the Starliner might actually fit into the station manifest. Boeing has announced on Jan 23rd that it expected to take another charge against earnings in the fourth quarter of 2024 because of Starliner, which could be hundreds of millions of dollars. The company didn't give more details during a January 28th earnings released an analyst call and has not yet submitted its 10K filing to the U.S. SEC that would include said information. Amid these developments, there has been a change in the management of the Starliner program. Recently, a familiar face has once again taken the lead in overseeing the development and execution of Starliner's mission. On Thursday, a Boeing spokesperson confirmed that John Mulholland is back in the role of VP of the company's commercial crew program, CCP, which manages work involving the CST-100 Starliner. He previously served in the role from 2011 to 2020 when he became VP and Program Manager for Boeing's ISS program, overseeing the initial development of CST-100 before naming it Starliner and managing the program through the inaugural flight of the spacecraft, the Orbital Flight Test OFT, in 2019. John Mulholland is a vice president of Boeing's commercial crew program following Mark Nappy's decision last year to retire from Boeing, Boeing said in a statement. John's deep customer knowledge and product understanding will be instrumental in leading the program. Nappy oversaw Starliner development and operations through two pivotal points, the Orbital Flight Test 2 in 2022 and Crew Flight Test CFT in 2024. The current position he's at is the Senior Program Advisor for Space Exploration Initiatives for Boeing's Exploration Systems Division. In this role, NAPI is focused on identifying opportunities for improvements across the division's programs. He's responsible for ensuring there's a disciplined approach to program management across Boeing's human spaceflight programs, stated a bio for NAPI prepared for the 2025 Spacecom Conference in 
Orlando. This includes incorporating lessons learned from Starliner into BES processes, relationships, and contracts, as well as leading lean activities and factory throughput on the Space Launch System core stage and exploration upper stage production. Nappy's decision to retire is in line with Boeing's corporate policy of mandatory retirement at age 65. He'll reach that age next month. Nappy referenced this change in roles during his first appearance on a Spacecom panel entitled The Power of Public-Private Partnerships. Good afternoon. My name is Mark Nappy. I work for Boeing. I'm kind of partly between jobs. I just got off the commercial crew program in another month. I'll be joining my wife as a retiree, Nappy said in his introductory remarks. I worked in human spaceflight for 40 years, space shuttle, SLS, commercial crew, some experiences with the ISS. The panel didn't focus much on the Starliner spacecraft or last year's CFT mission, but one of the audience questions did focus on what changes NASA would have wanted to see if he could turn back time and shift something with how NASA designed CCP. Traditional contracting with the government is more of a cost-type arrangement, and when you're working under a cost-type contract and the government wants you to do it this way, you can offer ideas, but when they want you to do it this way, you do it that way, Nappy said. And it doesn't matter how much it costs as a cost-type contract, you're here to work for the government. But when we're spending our money, we want to find out the best way to get it to them, and that's what we need to help them figure out. If I was able to change things about the commercial crew program and you'd hear the same thing from the other provider, I think we'd go back and revisit those requirements and make them more efficient. That's all for today's episode. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next time.